It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After the podcast, check out everything ChristianQuestions.com has to offer. Also see our weekly video series releases at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Now, here's your hosts, Rick and Jonathan. Charles Spurgeon once said, Rest time is not waste time. It is economy to gather fresh strength. It is wisdom to take occasional furlough. In the long run, we shall do more by sometimes doing less. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. I'm Jonathan. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. Folks, talk to us anytime at ChristianQuestions.com or our social media channels. Download some after-episode extras such as our thorough CQ Rewind show notes and our bonus Bible study questions available on our individual episode pages. And look for new videos for all ages every week at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. So Jonathan, what's on the table for today? Well, Rick, our question is, what does the Sabbath look like for Christians? And our theme text is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Okay, what does the Sabbath look like for Christians? One of the Ten Commandments was to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As Christians, we're always saying that the Ten Commandments are still necessary part of God's law that we should keep. If that's the case, why do the vast majority of Christians have their day of rest on Sunday, when the Sabbath that God set up for his people is Saturday. Are we really saying to keep only nine of those Ten Commandments? Are we being too creative with God's Word? What should we learn from the fact that there is no New Testament Scripture that officially moves the Sabbath to Sunday? So, coming up in today's podcast, the Jewish Sabbath in the Old Testament was explained with almost painful detail. Why? Well, in segments one and two, we explore the whole idea of God resting and what that meant for his people. Jesus caused a lot of trouble by healing on the Sabbath. Was he being purposefully disrespectful? (laughs) Segment three brings out a surprising answer. We are all so busy all the time. There never seems to be time or reason to do this Sabbath rest thing. So the question is, are we missing something? So we stare this question down in segment four. And finally, as Christians, what is my Sabbath rest supposed to look like? Segment five five lays, lays out what drives our rest and how we can capitalize on it. Rick, is the rest of a Christian different than the rest referred to in the Jewish law? Are Christians required to cease from all work on their Sabbath? And those are the questions that we want to actually get into and discuss thoroughly. And Jonathan, you know, in our in our preparation for this, there's a lot of great stuff coming up in this in this podcast. There really is. So folks are really excited to to bring this particular Bible study to you. We want you to stay with us through the whole thing. So let's get started right at the beginning. Okay. Why was Sabbath rest so important? Because it's it it occupies a huge place in the Old Testament. And let's look at the very beginning to establish why. So, Jonathan, let's go all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and then Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he, he, had, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Okay, so it's very specific. God rested. So was he tired? So did he need a breather? Let's look at the definitions of some of these words, um, Jonathan, or, or before, before we get into trying to get to the answer to that. Well, Rick, uh, rest means to repose, that is, desist from exertion. It also means to cease, desist, rest. Okay, so rest means to stop. And then it says he sanctified the seventh day. What does sanctified mean? We've talked about this before. It means to be clean. Okay, and really we, we look at that as being spiritually clean. Yeah, and all right, so now that we have the definitions, Rick, 
Why did God rest? Okay. Yeah, he wasn't tired. Okay, let's let's understand that right away. He wasn't tired. God rested to be able to allow the work that he had done to continue. He had started a lot of things in motion, and what we're going to see in this discussion of the Sabbath is how those things were allowed to develop, and there's some surprising pieces that are going to come out through this whole thing. So no, God wasn't tired. He wasn't like, oh, man, that was tough. That, that, that wasn't it. Not at all. Not even close. Okay? <laughs> so we've got God resting in Genesis in the creative work. Let's now fast forward a little bit to Exodus 31, 16, and 17. This is God speaking to Moses regarding the tabernacle, and this is after giving the law, you know, previously in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 31, 16 to 17. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Okay, so now, you know, it's interesting. You have Israel being told to follow the Sabbath according to God's rest many times. Um, And when you've got... So you had it in the commandments, and now it comes up again. It comes up several other times. But we chose this particular instance because it adds a little bit of a detail. It says, again, we see that God rested, all right? Yet there is this added description of God's activity. He was refreshed. Now, when it says he uh, to celebrate the Sabbath in the, in this verse, okay, it's talking about this day of... Uh, um, well, actually, what does it mean, Jonathan? It's a little bit of a different word. It, it's interesting, Rick. It means intermission. <laughs> <laughs> the Sabbath word means intermission. Okay, and so if you have an intermission, it's in be- between things, and mm-hmm. what was happening stops before it starts. So you've got this sense of this is, the sons of Israel shall observe an intermission, and they shall celebrate this intermission throughout their generations. And it says, you know, God ceased from his work, and this, the, this intermission is there. And then it says in this verse that he was refreshed. And this word for refreshed can literally mean to take a breath. It's not necessarily used when someone's tired, but also when someone sits back and looks at their work with satisfaction. Well, Rick, how about a practical uh, example? Every year I have cords of wood delivered, and they have to be stacked in sections, lined up properly so they... Don't fall over, which they've done before, by the way. (laughs) And it's a long, tedious process. And I'm exhausted when I'm done. And I wash up and I rest. But you know what I do? I always go out and take a look at my work. And I admire. It's done. It looks good. Ah, got it. So so what you're saying about God was the same about me? Uh, The sixth day he sat back and admired his work and that's it? Uh, well, no, that's not it, but that's a good start, and uh, that's good that you do that. <laughs> but, you know, there's much more to it, because the rest of God, what we'll see, is the rest of God was also the anticipation of what he had started, all of the processes he had put in place, and how they would unfold and develop and build his incredible plan. So there's much, much more to it than just saying, wow, that looks good. It was, yes, it was very good, not only because it was, but because of what it was going to bring. So that's part of what the rest of God is that we want to, to uh, focus on. You know, and just an additional thought about the idea of he, um, he sanctified the Sabbath day, God did. The idea of sanctified is to set it apart, to make it different for holiness. And so when we think of God's rest, we want to think of it in those terms, something set apart for holiness, because that's really what sanctification really is all about. So, Jonathan, we read um, Exodus chapter 31, 16 and 17. Let's go back a few verses and just get some of the context beforehand. Exodus 31, 12 to 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And Rick, uh, a lot of the points from this, the Sabbath was for the sons of Israel to identify them with their God. Okay, so they, it was a connector. The Sabbath was a connector. Don't forget that, that's important. 
Another great point, the Sabbath was a generational agreement. Which means that the Sabbath needed to be connected over and over again. The people, rather, need to be connected over and over again to God because humanity easily forgets. The Sabbath also was evidencing the fact of God setting them apart. And see, there's the sanctification. God set them apart. His people were sanctified. They were different than the other peoples of the world. And setting the seventh day apart accentuated the fact of being separate and different. And to sum up verses 14 and 15, which we didn't read, speaks of severe penalties for not keeping the Sabbath. Now, see, that's also interesting because they needed to keep it, and God said, and there's punishment if you don't. That's how important it was. So when we look at the seventh-day Sabbath, this is a serious, serious part of, of Jewish heritage, which is a huge, huge thing we don't want to uh, minimize or disrespect in any way. And the point in verse 16 and 17 above was speak of the Sabbath as a perpetual reminder of what God himself did. That's what we need to understand. First of all, we need to know that it was a perpetual reminder of what God himself did. But then we need, as Christians, we need to understand, okay, what is it that God himself did? Because what, what we see and what can be seen, we will see, are two different things. And that's, again, you've got to stay with us and, and watch this unfold because it really is phenomenal. So, Jonathan, the Sabbath rest point as we wrap up this segment. God established the Sabbath as a crystal clear focal point of rest and reverence. A crystal clear focal point of rest and reverence. You know, the Sabbath was God resting in his creative process. He was going to watch it develop now. That's what God's rest meant, and that's what we need to understand about the meaning of the Sabbath. And later on when we talk about how do you enter God's rest, that's really one of the key points that we uh, need to, to be looking at. So when God does something and then tells his people to do it as well, we had better pay close attention. The Sabbath was so important and one of the Ten Commandments. Why would we not follow it? Are you just getting started in your Bible studying? Or are you a weekly listener looking for more after the podcast? Go to ChristianQuestions.com, then click on the Bible Study tab to see our concise companion Bible study questions. You know, the most important, of the important part of the answer to this question is to clarify that we do believe in following the Sabbath, but in a different manner. This suggestion, though, cannot be taken lightly. In order for us to adhere to it, we need solid scriptural proof that plainly reveals why we can draw such a conclusion. So, Jonathan, what we don't want to be saying is, well, Christians have always had their, quote, Sabbath, unquote, on Sunday, so I will too. You know what? That's simply not good enough. It's just not good enough. What we need to understand is why would we do that, and what are the lessons, and why is it scripturally a sound approach? That's what we want to lay out here. So as we go through all of this, one of the things we want to do is to be able to establish a little bit of a, of a practical 21st century view of what should Sabbath look like for us in terms of practicality. Now, you know, we, we, we know it's, it's an awareness of God and all that, but uh, we're going to be going to um, Alan Parr from The Beat, and he talks about five ways you can observe the Sabbath. And he's, these are five very simple, practical ideas. Let's go to the first one right here. Number one is to relax. My friend, I've got news for you. You are not a machine. We, we can't just go and go all the time. To think that we can operate that way is operating out of pride. So we need to take a day of the week, one simple day, and just relax. That means go get a massage, uh, go and relax, maybe sit around, watch a movie. Our bodies need rest in order to function well. Now, we know this mentally, but we don't practice it. And this is the reason why so many people People are struggling with anxiety, depression, discouragement, low self-esteem, sleep deprivation, and all these other things. If we are going to honor our bodies as a temple of the Holy Spirit, it starts with getting the proper rest. So we don't want to take that out of context. And it's like, oh, hey, free for all. <laughs> you know, everything is done within a context of serious Christianity. But rest is a really important part 
of the context of serious Christianity because we're humans. If we don't take care of ourselves, how can we serve the Lord? Yeah, and really that's a huge, huge point. We have to, you want to be able to serve, and we all need to take a breath here and there, and that's part of the Sabbath. So we'll get to several other points, but that, uh, that gives us a start. So Jonathan, let's start with some solid scriptural proof. Our first solid scriptural proof is the Sabbath was the leading part of the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law, we all understand, was very different than the moral law in in, in Judaism. The Sabbath, we will see, was the leading part, the leading piece of the ceremonial law. And that's the ceremonial law that Christians really don't follow. How do we know that? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. So the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. So there are many of these appointed times that he's going to be describing here in Leviticus 23. The first is the Sabbath that we've been talking about. And then listen after that. So verses 3 through 6. For six days work may be done. But on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord, For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Okay, now these days of holy convocation, the Sabbath is one, were built to be times of rest. And remember you said that the definition of that word, Jonathan, was intermission. Right. So they were times of intermission to honor God. The seventh day was the original Sabbath template, and it was personally deeper than other Sabbath times. This is really important to understand. The seventh day Sabbath that God talked about in Genesis is the template for all of these others. Well, Rick, other Sabbath times, not just Saturday, you know, that's hard to wrap your head around because we don't hear that often. And what about Christians that believe in going to church on Saturday because they want to follow that very strictly? Do they follow the other um Sabbath. I don't know. That's a good question. And you, you've got to look at this and say, okay, if you're going to take part of this ceremonial thing, you need to follow through with the rest, I would think. Now, I don't know the answer to that, but there's some interesting um, commentary from John Gill in terms of the differences between the seventh day Sabbath and perhaps some of the others. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Other feasts were kept in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle or temple or where they were. But this was not only observed there and in their synagogues, but in their private houses, or wherever they were, whether traveling by sea or land. So what he's saying is that the seventh day Sabbath was very, very, very specific, that no matter where you were, you didn't go someplace to celebrate it. It happened within the confines of your own home, this not doing any kind of work. So it was really a solemn and serious, sanctified, set-apart time for God, for reflecting, for resting. And I think that's important. As a matter of fact, reflecting is the second point that Alan Parr is going to bring out from a practical standpoint of what the Sabbath can mean to us. Let's listen. Second thing I want you to do is to reflect. So I want you to take this time as an opportunity to reflect on your life. Think about where you are. Think about what things need to change, how things need to improve, how things need to get better in your marriage, better in your family, better in your relationships, and also reflect on where you want to be in the future. Set some goals. Use that day to come up with a strategic plan to get you to where you want to be in life. So you can use this day as simply a day of meditation. So, Jonathan, there's something very powerful in in giving yourself time to reflect, time to look at the aspects of your life and say, where am, am I with all of these things? What can I be doing? How can I be readjusting my approach? And that's really part of what Sabbath is all about, because that's pleasing to God. And prayer is a great part of that time, but meditating is listening for the answers 
to the prayers that you've given to our Heavenly Father. So you need that time. You really do. And, and you know, we also need to learn the idea of kind of mini Sabbath periods throughout our days, that time where we just, we just pause. You know, in the Psalms, it says, Selah, pause and consider. That's a Sabbath moment. Give a, we need to, to, to understand the important depth of those things. Anyway, back to the Jewish law. We've seen that there are days of holy convocation. They, they are, they are Sabbath-type things. There are several other Sabbath times within the Jewish law, all connected to its ceremonial aspects. The system of the Sabbath days and Pentecost, Sabbath years, every seventh year, and then the 50th year of Jubilee. This all has to do with Sabbath. All times of rest, be it for the people or the land. And Rick, that's interesting that you talk about Sabbath for the land. Now, did the land pausing and not using it for the crops for a year help the crops later on? What was the purpose? It, well, and that's exactly the point, is the land was able to restore itself, and, 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 its, and its inherent minerals and so forth were able to replenish, and the crops would grow stronger if you gave the ground rest. So God knew what he was doing when he is setting up these Sabbaths for the land and for the people, unquestionably. And, you know, for more detail on these things, look at the bonus material for the uh, CQ show notes. Uh, at the end, there's, there's a little bit more detail on some of these, and we don't have time to go into too many more. We do want to take a couple of other examples, though. The day of Pentecost, okay, in Jewish history was instituted as a Sabbath time by God. We're going to go a little further down in Leviticus 23 to verses 16 to 21. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. And summing up the next four verses, bring two loaves as a wave offering, seven male lambs, one young bull, and two rams as burnt offerings, one male goat as a sin offering, and two lambs as a fellowship offering. Now verse 21, on that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. So this day of Pentecost was a Sabbath time. It wasn't a Sabbath day necessarily because it says you aren't to do any regular work, not any work at all. So it's a little bit different, but you, you can see all the work involved in getting ready. You got to bring two loaves, seven male lambs, two young bulls, and you've got to get all this stuff together for the sacrifices. But it was, the point was you do the work so you can rest. You can rest and you can reflect and be honoring God. Another Jewish Sabbath was the seventh month, the, uh, the first day of the seventh month. We see this a little further down in Leviticus, Leviticus 23, verses 23 to 25. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Okay, so the seventh month, the first day of the month, is also a day of rest. Now, it's not the Sabbath, but it's a Sabbath time. The word for rest here comes directly from the word uh, for Sabbath. It means a special holiday. And again, kind of like the intermission thing. Rick, also uh, reflecting on God's goodness during these rests, but there also must be a health benefit for the Israelites. Well, there's always a health benefit to resting when one works hard. And I say when one works hard on purpose, because too much rest is not good for anyone. But not enough rest is not good for anyone either. And so God, look, those days it was tough to support yourselves. It was all physical, and you depended on so many things, and it really was sun up to sundown for most people. Rest was necessary, and God basically said, you need to stop, and you need to honor me, God, as your creator, and it will help you to rest and rejuvenate so you can go out and do your work again. So yes, God is smart. I mean, this is what the Sabbath tells us. He's smart because he gives the land Sabbath, he gives the people Sabbath, he gives the animals Sabbath. He really, really understands how all of this works. I'm mean, no surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, one other example uh, for, for this segment, the Day of Atonement was a Sabbath. Not a Sabbath time. The Day of Atonement was an actual Sabbath instituted on a once-a-year basis. We find that in Leviticus 16, 29 to 31. And Rick, uh, I had a question, but right before I read it, was the Day of Atonement the same as the seventh day of rest for God? 
And I would say, Jonathan, when we look at this, the answer is going to be no. It's a different Sabbath. And let's take a look at this, and, and we'll, we'll see, see why. Leviticus 16, 29 to 31. This shall be a statute for you forever. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall deny yourself and shall do no work, neither the citizen nor the alien who resides among you. For on this day, atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins. You shall be clean before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall deny yourselves. It is a statute forever. So it's a powerful example, but when it says it's on the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, it's not picking out the seventh day of a week. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. So it's a very clear picture that this is a Sabbath day as well. No work for anybody. So it's a very clear picture. And of course, atonement, when we understand atonement, we see Jesus as the atonement for our sins and the sins of the world. So the day of atonement was a day where everybody stops, because when you realize what it meant about Jesus, we realize the world can stop and say thank you, because it it affects everyone. And that's why it specifically says, even the aliens who reside among you, doesn't matter if they are of, of your faith or not, they should not work on that day. I think it's a powerful reminder of what the atonement actually meant, which is Jesus. So we can see there's a lot of different Sabbaths, Sabbath times and Sabbath days within the Jewish nation. What does all that mean? Let's take a look at our Sabbath rest principle for this segment. The rest required on the Jewish Sabbath was established to enable a reverent frame of mind to prevail. This was a necessary resetting principle and was driven by ceremonial cycles. Remember, it was ceremonial cycles. The cycles are what drove the Sabbath. And it was to establish a reverent frame of mind for all involved, and as you said several times, to give everybody and everything the rest it needed. Logical, clear, spiritual. Everything's included here, and that's what makes this such a beautiful, beautiful study. See, the second Sabbath, thing I want you to do is to reflect. So I want you to take that. Yeah, well, we already reflected. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Sabbath was much more than a day. It was a recurring break in the stress of life, and it came up constantly. With such an emphasis of stopping and looking up, why did Jesus seem to challenge the system? We're rolling out new series content this year. Multiple episodes on one topic over consecutive weeks, such as what do we do when the Bible seems to contradict itself? Go to ChristianQuestions.com and search for Bible Contradictions to see the full series of episodes and stay tuned for more new episodes and more new series releases at ChristianQuestions.com. You know, Jesus didn't seem to challenge the system. He outright sought to turn it on its ear. So why would he do that? Because the spiritual leaders of his day had completely undermined how the Sabbath and the law were supposed to be carried out. Jesus would correct this and then elevate it. So the thing to remember here is that Jesus was causing trouble because they needed to be shaken up to see God's way. So he's causing trouble for those who are straying. He's not causing trouble for God, but he's causing trouble for those who are walking away from God and claiming they are representing him. And he got in the way of that and did all of these things on the Sabbath. So before we get into that, let's go back to Alan Parr. Uh, You know, he talked about reflecting, you know, I mean, that must have been a big thing because he's talked about it twice. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, and this, this third point is really important. It's about reconnecting. Now, the third thing that I want you to do, which is going to be very hard, is to reconnect with God, which implied in that means we have to disconnect from everything else. And what do I mean by everything else? Work, social media, and anything that is going to distract us from spending unhurried and uninterrupted time with God. I've got news for you. God seldom speaks to us whenever we're distracted, whenever we've got text messages coming in, we got comments coming in, we've got emails coming in, we've got voicemails coming in, we got phone calls coming in, and yet we expect to hear from God. Using the Sabbath day as an opportunity for us to push all those distractions away and simply reconnect and re-engage with God. Unhurried, undisturbed reconnection. Think about that. 
Jonathan, how often in our lives are we unhurried? Oh, rarely. And it's such a great, great concept. We really should take advantage of this daily. And, and that's the point. It's not just a day, it's daily. Folks, think about your relationship with God. And if you are praying on the run, so to speak, like, okay, Lord, I got to say this really quick because I got to get to work on it. Think about that, Okay. We need to be able to back up and and even look even in the middle of the day and 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 I'll, frankly I do this a lot in the middle of a work day I, I literally push my 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 chair away from my desk I take a breath and I just try to reflect even if it's for a minute or thirty seconds or, you know just a short time to say <sighs> reset my focus reconnect with my father so that I can just be more Christ like in whatever it is I'm doing and it really is effective. So now we're going to focus on what did Jesus say about the Sabbath? What did he do about the Sabbath? So our, our solid scriptural proof here, we, we, we looked at the first scriptural proof as showing us that Israel had several different ceremonial parts to the Sabbath. What's our, where are we going with the second solid scriptural proof, Jonathan? Well, Jesus' objective for the Jewish Sabbath was to fulfill its requirements, to re represent it as God intended, and to lay the foundation to elevate it to a new Christian application. Okay, so three things. Fulfill its requirements, represent it as God intended, and lay the foundation to elevate it to a Christian application. That's Jesus' treatment of the Sabbath. That's what we're going to see uh, unfold here in this segment. Jesus reveals his mission regarding the law in Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And Rick, Jesus fulfilled the law as a perfect man. He did, until all is accomplished. And we understand that Jesus fulfilled the law. Now what does that mean? Well, we're gonna get to that in a little bit, okay? That's, that's a seed though, that's an important seed of understanding, because he says that not one stroke of this law shall pass away until all is accomplished. Hang on to that thought. We'll come back around to it. Interestingly, Jesus established himself and called himself Lord of the Sabbath. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement to make when we realize all that's behind Sabbath that we learned about in the first segment as he followed it, okay, with complete appropriateness. How is it that he was Lord of the Sabbath? Well, we've got four points that we're going to go through that help us understand this. The first point is it's going to show that the, uh, the, Jesus is going to show the practical but lost meaning of the Sabbath as a day to honor God and not to hurt men. We're going to drop in on Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and 7 and 8, and we're going to go through those, and then we're going to go down through verses 9 to 14 in a few minutes. And there's two very specific examples of dealing with the Sabbath. And we want to pay close attention because they happen consecutively. And they happen consecutively on the Sabbath for a good reason. So, Jonathan, let's start with Matthew 12, 1 to 2, and then 7 to 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Okay, so they're picking on them. And Jesus, what he does in the next few verses is he refers his accusers to David and how he fed his men in what would have been an unlawful fashion in the Old Testament. He also referred them to the fact that the Old Testament priesthood worked on the Sabbath. Okay, so he's saying, look, stop nitpicking on things. Look at your own book and realize what's happening here. And go ahead. And the Sabbath was not meant to starve men, Rick. It was meant to refresh them. It is a day to honor God. You don't honor God by hurting men. What is the most important thing? And that's the point of the Sabbath, is what is the most important thing, is for man to be able to stop, pause, and to be able to give their heart in honor to God. That's the most important thing. Let's not forget that connection. And Jesus is essentially telling the Pharisees, hey, look, you know, you're missing the point here. Let's, let's go to verses 7 through 8. But if you know what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. And Mark 2, 27 adds, the Sabbath was made for men and not man for the Sabbath, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, the principal point is 
that it is a rest for the whole world, Rick. You know, and, and that's such an important thing. We talked about atonement in the last segment, and here Jesus proclaims himself, and he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, and then he, he also says, the Mark account adds, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was made because God wanted man to have the ability to stop and look up and appreciate. The Sabbath was made for man to always be connecting. That's why God did it. That's what Jesus is saying. This is not what we're saying. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's an important point here for us to understand that you're right. It wasn't made to hurt people. It was made to help them, to give them rest, to give them the ability to honor and praise God. So now, pretty much right after that, we pick up Matthew 12, the next verses, 9 through 14. Listen, this is also on the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into the synagogue, and a man was whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. He said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. Can you imagine, before we get into the, 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 the discussion on this, just, just Jonathan, I just want to take, make the point. Imagine the tension of that moment where you have the, the leaders of the people saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus gives this example, and then he says, and he concludes, and he says, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he tells the man with the withered hand, stretch it out. And in front of everybody... He heals him. I mean, just just get the sense of the the tension and the 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 awe that would have happened on the Sabbath in front of all those. Well, the Pharisees were trying to prove uh, that he wasn't from God because he was doing works on the Sabbath. So they're trying to say, ah, see, 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 yeah. he's not from God. But the Pharisees they didn't get it. No, you know, and and that's the point. But I can imagine that the people did hearing the arguments back and forth and hearing the reasoning of Jesus and seeing the good that he did. And they're saying, and remember just before Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man. And so he's taking these lessons and he's applying them. There was a practical application earlier, and now there's this spiritual application with this healing. So, and that brings us to this, to this third point. Go ahead. And, and before that, I had a question. Did Jesus do most of his healing on the Sabbath? And if so, why? I I, I've heard people describe it either way. Yeah, you know, I, I think he did. Now, I, I, I haven't looked that up, but I, I seem to remember that. And I think that part of the reason that so much healing was done on the Sabbath is because the Sabbath is the culmination of God's plan. Okay, God rested because his plan was unfolding. Well, what's the culmination of God's plan? We know the culmination is what Jesus told every one of his followers to pray for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Restoration. So the healing was a picture of what the seventh day was bringing. So yes, he does this healing on the Sabbath because it is the intention of God. It's the rest of God that brings this. And we're going to see this unfold as it's going to get bigger and bigger as we go. This is just so cool. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's such an important point to, to look at. Jesus, now this is the third point. You know, the first point, the, the practical but lost meaning of the Sabbath is a day to honor God and not hurt men. Um, the second point, um, the compassionate but lost meaning of the Sabbath. It was a preserver and an enhancer of life and not a dire and heartless requirement of things. And now the third point Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, is teaching. Now listen, he's teaching the mind of God regarding the Jewish Sabbath. God's rest was a result of the successful work he had done by the power of his own spirit. This was to bless humanity, the crowning touch of his earthly creation. And Jonathan, that's why with your question, it's so important to realize God wants to bless the human race. The healing was a picture of that blessing. And the point is to bless humanity and connect them to the Creator so they can adore Him. You know, and, and when we, we talked about, you know, what it means to bless uh, several, several podcasts ago, and, and to, to bless God means to appreciate and adore Him. 
for God to bless us means he appreciates and adores us as his little children. We, we adore and appreciate him as this almighty God. That's what the Sabbath was for. And Jesus is showing us by his actions on the Sabbath how to adore and bless God. Just, it's a, such, a, such a wonderful thing because his blessings flow out to us. And that brings us to the fourth point of this whole thing. Jesus also taught what the Sabbath rest would come to mean for Christians. Um, that's, why they, that's why he healed so much on the Sabbath. The work of God's Spirit would bring restored life. We would be required to rest in that. So we've got these examples in Matthew 12. Matthew 12, the first part of the, the chapter there, was a physical example on the Sabbath. Matthew 12, verses 9 to 14, was the spiritual example on the Sabbath. Both times Jesus is challenged, both times he shows what the Sabbath is really there for, and that he's Lord of the Sabbath. Well, the verses just before Matthew 12 are in, guess what, Matthew 11. Now we all know that. But Jonathan, honestly and truly, I have never in my own mind connected the end of Matthew 11 with the beginning of Matthew 12. Why? I don't know. I just never did. <laughs> I learned a big lesson here. <laughs> These are writings. They're really not separated in the Bible, right. but they just put numbers to organize. That's yeah, all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, but let's read now. With the idea of these big lessons of the Sabbath in Matthew 12, let's read the last verses of Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and I will give you rest. And then it says right after that, at that time, this is how Matthew 12 starts, at that time Jesus went through the grain field. So that must have been spoken on the Sabbath as well. So when you look at that, you see this is an incredible connection. He's talking about giving his followers rest, and then he physically shows what the Sabbath, what the day of rest, really is all about. And he's showing them that it's higher, it's bigger, it's more profound than anything they'd ever seen before. So Jesus is saying, I will give you rest. Why? Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Why? Because Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus was helping us to understand that. And it's, we, what we're getting here is through him that our Sabbath is truly fulfilled. He is the conduit of our resting in God. And we're really going to develop that as we go further. Our Sabbath rest point for this segment. The Jews were to rest in the fact that God's power through creation was very good, so God rested. Jesus expands our Christian rest to be based in God's power to restore man. That's why he healed on the Sabbath. And that's why he continually explained that the healing on the Sabbath wasn't a, a negative, but it was a positive because it was actually reflecting on what the intention of the rest of God really was. This is a big point we're going to develop further right now. So Jesus himself subtly but powerfully expands the concept of Sabbath resting to resting in God's next phase. How did the apostles absorb and expand Jesus' Sabbath teaching in the infant Christian church? If you love our podcast, show us some love on social media. Search for our handle, at CQ Bible Podcast, or just search for Christian Questions on Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and Twitter. Now back to our discussion. Now, the first thing we're going to notice about the New Testament writings of Jesus' followers is the stark absence of any teaching on keeping the Jewish Sabbath. With the majority of Christians destined to come from pagan backgrounds, the Sabbath would have fundamentally dominated their instruction. Rick, that is interesting. No teaching from the apostles on keeping the Sabbath for the Christian? Really? Really. As a matter of fact, as we'll see, it's a very different perspective. Why? If the Sabbath is so important, why? Well, let's dig deeper now. Now that we see Jesus' position in relation to the Sabbath and relation to his followers, let's dig deeper and go a little further. First, though, let's go back to Alan Parr with the beat and his five ways you can observe the Sabbath 
Remember, the last one was important, was reconnecting with God. And now it's very similar, but just much more about those around us. Let's listen. The fourth thing that I want you to do is to use this opportunity as a time to relate to other people. In other words, spend time investing in the relationships that God has given you, whether that may be friendships, whether that may be an opportunity to spend time with your spouse or your children or other family members or whatnot. But this is an opportunity for us to say, you know what, I'm not going to be focused at this point on getting a task done and checking something off my checklist. No, I'm going to be fully engaged and fully present in this relationship relationship so that I can give everything I have to relating to other people. I know it's very difficult because you've got all these different things that are competing for your time, but if we could just disengage from these other things, then we can have true fellowship and community with other people. Now, you know, you can look at that and say, well, wait a minute, you know, Rick and Jonathan, you're saying rest on the Sabbath. That's a lot of work to relate to other people. <laughs> it is. But, but, you know, the point is to pull away from all of the other things that get in the way of, and you said it before, the most important things. What are the most important things? The most important things are to love and honor God. How do we best do that? By loving and honoring those around us and following the will of God. That's part of the Sabbath thinking of a Christian, is let's do that and let's focus on those things, not in a hurried way, but in a way that is profoundly uh, accepting and open to just try to build where we're generally too hurried to do so. Just let, let, kind of pause, sila, pause and, and consider these things. Okay, let's get now to the writings of those uh, outside of Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus had just shown us in the last seven the, the fulfillment of what the rest of Sabbath would ultimately represent. And it's kind of shown to us again in Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And actually, that is the beast in context whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, the key point, we're not going to talk about the beast and all of that. The key point of this verse, the only reason we're bringing it up is the phrase, written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's an interesting thing, because we know Jesus didn't die until, you know, 2,000 years ago. How could he have been slain from the foundation of the world? It had to be in God's mind at that time. And that's exactly the basis that we want to remember. So hang on to that point, because that becomes a big, big building block for understanding Christian Sabbath. We're supposed to rest in God's plan. If it was in God's mind, it means it was in God's plan. And if it's in God's plan, that's what we rest in. So let's take a let, we'll, we'll look at that. We'll develop that. Our third solid scriptural proof, Jonathan, is what? The New Testament writers clearly and emphatically build on the principles of this higher meaning of rest, of Sabbath for Christians. You know, the meaning of rest, the meaning of Sabbath for Christians is not Sabbath day so much as it is Sabbath rest. That's the thing we want to focus on. Now, the Apostle Paul makes a pretty emphatic statement about the Sabbath as part of the obsolete ceremonial law. And you say, what? Well, listen, Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So Paul is talking to Christians who were formerly of a pagan background and saying, don't let others judge you in regard to your food or your drink or in respect to Jewish festivals or new moon because the cycles of, of nature, a lot of Jewish rituals were, were, were built around that, or a Sabbath day. He's lumping those things together. He's saying, so don't be judged by those things because they were mere shadows of what's to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So the law and all of its ceremony Paul is saying, led to Christ, led to the real thing, as any shadow leads to the real person. And Rick, only light shining reveals the shadow and then leads us to its reality. Where there is no light, there is no shadow. Where there is no shadow, you don't find the reality. And that's what Paul is using. He's saying the light of God's truth showed a shadow, that when you follow it, you come to the real thing. And he says implicitly, Jesus is the real thing. Everything before is to bring us to him. 
So what do we do with that in relation to Sabbath? Well, let's develop it further. Go to another one of uh, uh, the Apostle Paul's writings, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Making known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him unto a dispensation, which means administration, of the fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ, the things in heavens and the things upon the earth in him. Okay, so remember when Jesus said the law would stand until all was accomplished? Well, we rest in the recognition of Jesus as the centerpiece of God's plan. It says to sum up all things in Christ. That's the new administration that he's talking about. And when we think about administration, we think about politics. It is how the times are governed. The time of reconciliation in God's kingdom will be under a new administration, which is Christ and his faithful ones governing from heaven over the whole world. And so there is the future administration that you just described. Now, the present administration for Christians is different than the previous under the law. You had the law, the law was the administration, if you will, and now you have Jesus, the centerpiece in the gospel's administration, and then, like you said, the, 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 the culmination is the ministry of reconciliation. So we've got what the apostle is saying is there's a time frame for all of these things. And we have to recognize and respect that and follow God's will through the different time frames. So keep that in mind. The apostle gave us clear guidance regarding worship, the Sabbath, and ceremonies. We're called to be a new creation. Now, this is interesting, because remember, God's creation was good. Remember, very good. And he rested, all right? We're called to be a new creation, which was in place before the foundation of the world, but was only realized after Jesus' faithful sacrifice during the seventh day in which God rested. So, what we're saying is, it was already in place, but it was not recognizable yet just like the sacrifice of Jesus had not been recognizable yet. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, about this new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So, Jonathan, that... that culminates the, the two things you and I were both just talking about. It talks about Jesus as the center. It talks about this new creation, this calling out of God, uh, the calling, calling of all nations, a people for his name, a heavenly calling. And then the reason for that is this ministry of reconciliation. So here's the thing, thinking about the Sabbath again and the sacrifices and all of that. As Israel was temporarily reconciled by ceremony and sacrifice— much having to do with the Sabbaths, we are once reconciled by Christ. And Rick, 2 Corinthians said, when it said old things are passed away, even the Jewish law for the Christian passed away from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. And that's why we look at the ceremonial law and say those things passed on by, and the moral things still are there, as a matter of fact, but the moral things are more stringent. And Take a look at Matthew chapter 5 as Jesus raises the standard on so many of the moral aspects of the law. So it's not like everything was junked. No, 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 no. The ceremonies were just no longer needed. Morality, always needed. And so those pieces of the law followed through. But that's, that's the point. So where does the Sabbath fit? Does the, does, does the Sabbath day, is it like old and gets thrown away? No, but it's recognized differently. And that's what we have to understand. Paul aligns, I'm sorry, Paul again alludes to our Sabbath not needing to be a specific day. So now, and this is going to be in Romans 14, 5 through 6, and then verse 9, the thing we want to understand is the Apostle Paul or any of the writers of the New Testament are not saying, oh no, no more Sabbath day. What they're saying is Sabbath is now, has a new way to be looked at through Christian eyes. And th- these are the things that they are, are explaining to us here. Romans 14, 5 and 6, and then 9. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And Rick, 
Paul recognized and respected the Jewish Christians' attachment to the ceremonial law. He did. He recognized it. He was sensitive to it. And he said, look, it's okay. I understand. And if, if it's something that, that, that those, those individuals feel like they have to do, that's okay. As long as they keep putting Christ at the center, it's okay. Because their mind is not able to wrap around other things. Okay, let them grow. Give them time. Give them space. What a great lesson. Yeah, that is you know, for us, right? <laughs> well, it is. It is because we, we need to be able to look upon our brothers and sisters with that same kind of kindness and wisdom to say, okay, if that's what they can see and we think that, that, that there's more, that's fine. Just doesn't mean you, you shun them. It means that you fellowship with them on the common ground that you have and you try to encourage each other to be as strong as we possibly can. Great point, Rick. And, and, and it's a great point by the Apostle Paul. So this whole point that we've been talking about through these scriptures is the Sabbath day, the seventh day, is not the important thing for the Christian, but Sabbath rest is. Sabbath rest is. As a matter of fact, remember, Jonathan, we touched on the day of Pentecost earlier on, and it was a day for Jewish resting in God. Okay, they rested in the fact that his spirit, God's spirit, formed that which was, quote, very good and caused God himself to rest in creation. The day God chose, this is interesting, the day God chose, fast forward a few thousand years now, the day God chose to give the Holy Spirit to Christianity was the day of Pentecost. That's right. Remember Jesus, he rises 40 days after his, 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 um, his resurrection, uh, he rises to heaven and he says, stay in Jerusalem until Pentecost, okay? And that's the day the Holy Spirit comes to the church. That's the day God chose to pass on his spirit to others. God was now giving the same spirit that, that did the work of creation to, the, to this whole new creation, which was also very good, but it was previously not revealed, although it was a part of God's plan. So the key to remember is that this new creation, and we'll see this in the next segment very plainly, this new creation was already a part of God's plan. And on one of those days of Sabbath resting, God said, here's another part of my plan. Already had it in my mind, but here it is, to physically unfold because Jesus has done his work. It's all about Jesus. The reason we look at the Sabbath differently through Christian eyes than Jewish eyes is all because of the work of Jesus. What's our Sabbath rest point here? The rest of the Jewish Sabbath was based on God's rest from his earthly creation, while the rest of the Christian is based upon God's rest from establishing his earthly to spiritual creation. It's um, based on the same thing, but it's based in a deeper way. Why? Because we get to know more since Jesus than they knew before. It's really that simple. The differences in Christian Sabbath perspective are clear. I need to take Christian Sabbath rest seriously. What does a Sabbath rest look like for a Christian? Should it be every Sunday? Does it matter? Our team of volunteers are accomplishing amazing work every week as we release new audio, video, and web content, helping create the Christian Questions Multimedia Ministry. There are several ways you can get more involved in our not-for-profit mission. Click on Support CQ in our main menu on ChristianQuestions.com. All right, there is absolutely a Sabbath rest for Christians. As we have already seen, it is defined differently than the Jewish Sabbath. The proven concept of a Sabbath day should not be cast aside lightly, though the application, as we've been saying, is different. So let's look at the why of our rest and find the how of our rest. And Jonathan, before we get into this next example, it's going to be talking about Joshua from the book of Hebrews. What we want to focus on, the, the principle is resting in God's eternal providence. That's what God himself rested in. We're going to see that pop up again, but I want to mention it here. We want to find a way to rest in God's eternal providence. What does that mean? Stay with us for this segment, and hopefully it will unfold. Okay, Joshua takes over from Moses, 
and because you know Moses is not going to go into the into the promised land and and he did bring the people Joshua did bring the people into the promised land but they did not fully enter the rest of God because they were disobedient Paul in Hebrews chapter 4 is looking back on that in Hebrews 4 verses 8 through 11 For if Joshua had given them rest he God would not have spoken of another day after that so there remains a sabbath rest for the people of God for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. And Rick, other translations say, labor into rest, instead of be diligent to enter that rest. It takes work to enter his rest. It sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> The only rest worth entering is one that we labor to get to. And, 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 you know, when it's the rest of God, we need to work at being able to take our physical beings and our, our, our physical perspectives and to be able to lay them aside and replace them with utter faith and rest in God's eternal providence. It's not a contradiction. It is a valuable investment of time and effort. We want to labor to enter into God's rest. So how do we enter, enter into that rest? Well, what we do is we focus on what God has done, what God is doing, and God, what God will do. Well, didn't he finish his work? Yes. But wait, there's more, okay? Hebrews 4, verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he had said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. See, now you've got this foundation of the world phrase coming up again. Remember we, we mentioned it last segment and said, hey, hang on to that. And it was talking about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The apostle Paul brings that back up, and he says that the Jewish people did not enter into God's rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's reminding us that their rest was based on the fact that God had finished that work. And remember, we were talking about God looking at that work saying, this is very good. And, and let me add another dimension. God not only said, this is very good, but watch how it works out. Watch mm. how it continues to develop. Because nice. God's creative process was processes that were put in place. And he was letting them, in his rest, he was letting them develop. Because his plan is perfect. So we want to understand how important that is. Those God, though God's works were finished, all of them had not yet been revealed. But all the principles were in place. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm going to do Alan Parr one more time. Then we're going to get to some principles that the Jewish nation was not able to see because it was not yet time. That's a critical point, though. Okay, final point from Alan Parr, uh, five ways you can observe the Sabbath. Um, the, the last point that he had talked about was relating to others, and now uh, this is one that I think we can all very, very much relate to and say, okay, got to do this. And the fifth and final thing you can do on this day is to rejoice or to remember or to recall. And the idea here is to just take some time and just think about what God has done in your life and how he's blessed you and how good he's been to you. And just simply say, God, I rejoice today. I thank you I have a roof over my head. I thank you that my children are safe. I thank you, God, that I have a job. I thank you, God, that my business is doing well. And just take this time to recount the blessing that God has given you and just worship and praise God and and rejoice to God for his goodness over your life. You know, and I want to add a point to that, uh, maybe a couple of points. You know, he says, you know, I thank you, God, that I've got a roof over my head and my children are safe. What if they're not? What if things aren't going well? Does that mean, okay, well, that part is, is canceled? No. What it means is we say, thank you, God. I'm going through hard, hard times right now, but I know, but I know that your providence is, is over me and over my family as we go through whatever it is we're going through. So I thank you for that providence, and I thank you for the difficulty because I know I'm going to learn from it. I don't know how. It seems impossible, but I know you know. So that's the kind of rest we want to have. How do we leave our labors and enter into God's rest? That's how. And you mentioned it before, Jonathan. Prayer is such an essential, essential part of doing this. Rest in the fact that the plan of God 
from the very beginning had salvation in life as its very basis. And that means for you and your family and your loved ones. So we had been, we've been alluding to the fact that there are several things that the Jews saw in the creative process completed when God said, very good, but there are things that they didn't see because they weren't available yet. This all comes down to that phrase, from the foundation of the world. And that means from before mankind was even created, in the mind of God, these things existed. And when something exists in the mind of God, Jonathan, it's as good as done. You got it. There are three things that our Christian rest should additionally rely upon, rather than uh, built upon, rather than um, built upon what the Jews already knew. The first is the ransom price for Adam was already in order, and we touched on this already, but we're going to do it again. First Peter one nineteen and twenty, King James version. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay. The blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish, foreordained before the foundation of the world. See, what Peter is telling us is before the world was even created, you had this price already in order. Because that's what God's, God's plan was. God knew sin was going to happen, and he prepared for it. So in the mind of God, in the mind of God, the price was already paid. Keep yes. that in mind, okay? Because we're talking about God's providence, okay? Rest in the past payment of the ransom. Why is it the past payment? Well, we know it's past because 2,000 years ago Jesus died. But in the mind of God, it was there for who knows how long. It brought forgiveness for our sins. See, God rested in his own providence. He rested in his own providence. And that's the key for us resting in him. Rest in his providence because he rested in that. He had the ransom price in place in his mind. But that's not all. The second thing he had in his mind at the foundation of the world is the calling of the true followers of Jesus. It was already there. It was already in order. How do we know? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. As he chose us in him. The us is not talking about you and me as individuals. It's talking about the collective call of the body of Christ. And he said, as he chose us, the body of Christ, from when? The foundation of the world. Again. So in the creative process, in the mind of God, God had this group already chosen. Now, were the individuals already chosen? I don't believe so. But the group was already chosen, just like the ransom was chosen. And it was complete in the mind of God. See, we need to rest in the providence of God because he rested in the providence of himself. And there is no greater. But wait, there's even more than that. You've got Jesus from the foundation of the world. You've got the call of the true church, which are the ministers of reconciliation from the foundation of the world. Third is the redemption of the world was already in order before anything happened. Matthew 25, verses 33 to 34, is the setting of the parable of the sheep and the goats. This happens after the period of judgment, after the final judging, and here's what it says about the righteous. On the earth. I'm sorry, Jonathan. It's the righteous on the earth. I want to make sure that that point is plain. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Again. So when God says he looked upon his creation, and behold, it was very good, and God rested what we're seeing is not only was that physical creation very good and he stopped because he's saying, watch this unfold, but he had all of these things that we now see through scripture were in his mind that were part of that creation. They just weren't yet revealed. And the beauty is when you have the new creation, the, 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 the children of God, so to speak, you know, be, being given, given God's spirit, that's something that we say, well, it's brand new. It's brand new in its revealment, 
but it's very old in its planning, in its destiny, in its place in the providence of God. How do you enter into the God's rest? You enter into resting in his providence because that's what he did, and it included all of us. Wait, Rick. Satan stopped God's plan and is in control, right? No, Satan never had control. God permitted him to do what he did for an everlasting lesson from humankind, but God permitted evil. He did. He permitted it. And, and, and make no mistake, like you said, Satan never has control beyond what God allows, not an inch beyond. So we need to understand that God's plan is so comprehensive that to rest in his providence is to rest in its conclusion which was foreordained before all of this. That's how we enter into God's rest. We look at that and say, God has got this. Unequivocally, always had, and always will. So we need to rest in the future reconciliation and salvation of the world, because God did. God rested in the future reconciliation of the world. God rested in the call of the true church. And God rested in the ransom price of Jesus before they all happened. So we can too. It's a powerful way for us to celebrate Sabbath. So let's take a look at, just as we wrap this up, the early church, the early Christian church in Scripture, they chose Sunday, the first day of the week, as a day to gather, a day to study, a day to reflect, a day to pray, and a day to praise. It was Resurrection Day, because Jesus was raised on the first day of the week, the day that unfolded God's previously unknown plan. Those three things we, we just talked about from the foundation of the world. The first and foremost was the lamb slain. He's raised and it proves that his being slain was acceptable on the first day of the week. Revelation 1.10 gives us a sense of, of, of the way the early church looked at this first day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. On the Lord's day. They called Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. Why? He raised from the dead. And Jonathan, his raising from the dead was the unequivocal seal of God's plans. Everything God planned was, was, was shown in black and white evidence the moment Jesus is raised from the dead. Because you've got the fulfillment of justice and you've got the surety, the physical evidence, the surety that God's plan is moving forward. So, the early church recognized the power of this, and they called it the Lord's Day. Acts 20, verse 7 is another example of how that day was important to them. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them. Intending to leave the next day, he prolonged his message until midnight. Okay, so when were they meeting? On the first day. On the first day of the week. That was a common occurrence. So when we as Christians now continue that process of meeting on the first day, what are we really doing? We're meeting on the day that they called the Lord's Day, the original followers of Jesus. We're meeting on the day that represents resurrection. And with the resurrection of Jesus, it represents in a nutshell the entire plan of God. Because you know what it is? It's life. And that's what the plan of God is. So again, one other scripture on this before we wrap up. 1 Corinthians 16.2. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. So Paul was preparing for coming, and he's saying, look, when you guys get together on the first day of the week, you know, put your, the, the dollars aside that you want me to take and, and give to other Christians who are in need. Notice it wasn't a collection for Paul. It was a collection, no, it it was a collection for those who were in need. And Rick, there's a lot of wisdom for Sundays. It wouldn't interfere with the Jewish day of worship. I, I think that really makes sense. It does. It's, it's respectful, and it is, uh, it, it is a sense of saying, essentially, that you know, we're built right beyond that. Right after, right after you have the Sabbath, you have the, the culmination of God's plan in the resurrection of Jesus. So, folks, Sunday is a, is a day for us to really try and set self, ourselves aside and say, there's so much to be thankful for. There's so much to slow down and just stop and look up and to, and, and to just readjust. It's a great time to do that. 
Rick, what does Sabbath mean to you personally in your life? You know, for me, Sabbath is the ability just to stop. And I try to take little Sabbaths all along the way. And a lot of times when I'm trying to work on things and I get stuck, I take a Sabbath. I, I get up, I walk away, I do something else, I think about something else, I try to just just rest my mind and come back and, and, and let things become new. And so for me, Sabbath is, 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 is a constant thing. And, you know, we work on Sunday mornings leading studies with our class and all of that. But, you know, Sunday afternoon, I really do try to just say, okay, you know what, it's family, and it's just let, let life, the outside of life, just go on someplace else. And it's a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. So for me, th- thanks for, for asking. Let's wrap this up, Jonathan. Sabbath rest for this segment. Christian Sabbath rest is necessary. It is not just about our physical activities. It very much centers on focusing and refocusing our spiritual mind. A day of rest is ideal. Pause, reflect, pray, and revitalize. So Christian Sabbath is different. Christian Sabbath is not bound by the confines of a day or ceremony. It's not controlled by physical cycles of the earth. Christian rest is based upon the life-altering gift of Jesus as a ransom. It's, it's built upon God calling us to follow in Jesus' sacrificial footsteps, which simply means we're privileged to be about our Father's business. Our rest is celebrated in the beginning of God's own spirit, his own power and influence dwelling within us and working through us. Each day that we take these gifts and center them in our life is a day of rest. So folks, we can have many days of rest as we have that day of rest. And the important thing is, it's all about Jesus, and it's all about life. All of it put in place from the foundation of the world. That is the providence of God that he rested in, and that's the providence of God that we should rest in. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our program is subscribing to Christian Questions in iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast channel is. Please rate us and review us. We greatly appreciate it. And coming up next week, is obedience more important than sacrifice? Hmm. Talk to you about that next week. Thank you.